Hi guys, it's me Chazar HD and welcome to this podcast episode reviewing the Azerbaijan Grand Prix in Baku, a race that for the first, what, 40-45% of that race on Sunday, it looked like we were in for quite possibly the worst race of the season in terms of entertainment. It was, you know, the start of the race was, was decent, you know, the two Red Bulls making moves on the first lap I remember, but after that, until we got, you know, a couple of laps after the first round of pit stops for the front runners, there was absolutely nothing happening. And then suddenly, the race winner, Oscar Piastri, what a performance from him, sprung the race into life by performing an incredible overtaking move. Still, just can't believe he actually pulled it off. Not just the overtake, but the performance and the win overall was just incredible what we saw from Piastri in Baku. And then, yeah, once that overtake happened, the race just turned into something very special. And it was a very enjoyable race. And, thankfully, we didn't need a million safety cars to create an exciting race in Baku. So, yeah, fantastic and it was that race and I think I said it on stream on my race watch along even Nib I think said it you know that race in terms of the battling that's what we want races to be overtakes are great but it's the battles you remember and that's why we will remember this Grand Prix because of not just the overtake of Piastri but the battling we saw all race long um, and the quality of it you know, just shows the quality of these drivers. But yeah, what a race in Baku. And I'll, uh, you know, obviously show the race results uh, before we get properly into things. Oscar Piastri taking his second win in Formula 1 ahead of Charles Leclerc in second. Leclerc also drove brilliantly, but Piastri was just better at the end of the day. Uh, third, George Russell, fortunate to get a podium, obviously after the Carlos Sainz and Sergio Perez accident very late on. And then fourth, Lando Norris. Fifth, Max Verstappen, a disaster of a race for Verstappen and still uh, losing points to Lando Norris in the championship. Sixth, Fernando Alonso. Seventh, Alex Albon. Eighth, Franco Colapinto in his second F1 race, finishing in the top eight. And what a race it was for Williams. Ten points on the board, which for them is massive. Lewis Hamilton finishing in ninth. Obviously had a poor day. Uh, we'll get more into that later on. And then P10, Oliver Behrman, who also got points on his second F1 Grand Prix. But of course, he scored points on his debut for Ferrari back in Saudi Arabia. Um, but yeah. What a race in Baku, but let's get into the teams and how it all played out in Baku. And of course, we will start with the race winners, McLaren, and start with Oscar Piastri. Now, those first 20 laps or so, Piastri didn't do anything wrong. You know, he wasn't able to pass Leclerc on the first lap. Kept a bit close to Leclerc first two or three laps, but then Leclerc relentlessly pulled away in the Ferrari um, and eventually built the gap up to about, I think, five and a half, six seconds when Piastri and Leclerc, you know, came in for their uh, only pit stops of the Grand Prix. And at that point, I thought Leclerc, you know, obviously when he pitted, he came out two or three seconds clear, I think, of Piastri. And I thought, yeah, Le Leclerc's going to win the race. Ferrari... Let's be honest, even though McLaren won, Ferrari did have the fastest car in Baku. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. Not only did Leclerc prove that with how quick he was behind Piastri after Oscar overtook him, but look at the pace Carlos Sainz had in the last 20 laps of the Grand Prix. Again, proving that Ferrari were legitimately, I think you could even say clearly, the fastest team in that race, but of course ended up not taking the victory. Um, but for Piastri, yeah, Leclerc wasn't quite getting, you know, his tyres up to temperature. Maybe was a bit lackadaisical, thinking he was, you know, all comfortable out in the lead. And then Piastri got right up behind him, and as soon as he had an opportunity, went for that inside line. And still, when I see replays online of that overtake, I still can't believe he actually went for the gap, because he was so far back 
in a braking zone, you have to remember, it's not a great braking zone for overtaking. It very easy to lock up and go wide at that corner, even if you're, you know, on the racing line. So, yeah, for him to pull that move off and not go wide, not lock up, not even have to adjust the steering, really, was just incredible. And then what we saw after that was, and as I said on stream, a perfect lesson in where to place your car when defending position and a perfect lesson in, you know, exactly how to keep you, you know, yourself ahead of the car behind. It was just a masterful performance by Oscar Piastri. It was perfection on, on the racetrack. That's what we saw. That performance in Baku is arguably the best quality race win we've seen this year. What I mean by a quality race win is, obviously, you know, whoever's won the race in terms of how well they performed to get that race win. Other very high quality race wins this year, obviously, would be Leclerc at Monza. Um, Lewis Hamilton at Silverstone would be another. Verstappen at Probably the Canadian Grand Prix, I think you'd throw, throw in there, given how uh, you know, the bad the track conditions were at times. And obviously it was constantly raining on and off. Um, you could even say Lando Norris probably a Zandvoort, given just how incredibly quick he was, even though the McLaren was, you know, super fast um, itself. But that performance from Piastri, again, arguably the best quality race win we've seen in 2024. And... Once again, proving that, you know, he may, you know, have been told pre-Baku that, you know, he needs to help Lando Norris in the championship. But don't get it twisted. Oscar Piastri is an elite Formula One driver. That is what the race in Baku absolutely confirmed. And we've seen in the last few weeks that Oscar Piastri is an elite driver. He is right up there with the very best in our sport. And if he keeps getting better, there is no reason why Piastri isn't world champion material. From what I'm seeing, I think he is world champion material. Um, he's, in terms of the way he performs in the races, where, again, that's where it matters most... It's doing exactly what you would expect of a world champion. You know, producing overtakes at the perfect time. Getting everything right in terms of the key moments in a race. The starts right. Again, making the overtakes at the right time. Defending well. Consistently quick. Doesn't make mistakes. Managing the tyres pretty well. He doesn't really put a foot wrong at the moment, does Piastri. I mean, the last Grand Prix where I think maybe he could have done better was probably the Dutch Grand Prix. Overall, that weekend, though, I think, you know, he just wasn't quite quick enough in terms of his own pace. But, again, most of the time in the last few races, he has got the absolute maximum out of his machine. And that's why Piastri has been either winning or finishing in second place a lot of the time in the last few weeks. Uh, so yeah, what a performance by Piastri. And another thing I want to point out with that overtake that he performed on Leclerc, but it is that, and it's something that Nigel Mansell, who obviously he was an amazing overtaker himself back in his, his day in the 80s and the 90s, Nigel Mansell said it, and it's been repeated a lot since then, and it is so true that if you're going to overtake someone, you have to do it immediately. Because if you don't get it done immediately, the driver ahead will then learn where you, you know, you're quicker, where you're slower, and will be able to, you know, get used to having you behind and will be able to more so comfortably hold their position. You've got to just go in there, make the overtake happen and move on. And that's exactly what Piastri did. First chance he got, didn't think, oh, let's wait. No, he just sent it in there. You know, as uh, Daniel Riccardi would say, licked the post stamp and sent it. And got it done because of his own quality. And that's why Oscar Piastri won 
the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. And I'll be honest, it's a shame that Piastri is not the main man for McLaren in terms of the championship. No disrespect to Lando Norris, who I'll get onto in a moment. I thought he performed very well in the race, did Lando. But at the moment, in terms of the races, I think Red Bull probably would fear Piastri more in the championship than Lando because Piastri is getting the most out of the McLaren when Lando isn't always getting the best out of the McLaren. So it's a shame he's a bit too far back. The absolute best, you know, Piastri's going to finish in the championship. will be second if Norris's teammate, of course, falls apart. And Leclerc, you know, if his level drops, then, you know, that will help Piastri get up uh, from where he is in the championship. Still in P4 is Oscar. Um, but going forward for the rest of the year... There is no reason why Oscar Piastri can't keep winning races. For example, you know, this coming weekend in Singapore, McLaren should have the fastest car. Maybe Ferrari will be kind of in the fight. I think they'll be decently quick. But again, it should be McLaren's race to lose. Similar to what we saw in Hungary. In fact, I'd probably say McLaren probably be a bit more dominant in terms of speed compared to what we saw in Hungary. So... There's no reason why Piastri can't win there. And then looking, you know, at, at the final six races after that, again, there's plenty of opportunities for Oscar. You know, uh, US Grand Prix, Mexico. Uh, obviously, the Qatar Grand Prix, remember? Penultimate race of the season this year. Look at what Piastri did there last year. He was, even though he didn't win the race on a Sunday, he was probably the best driver over, over the course of the race weekend, given that the McLaren was still clearly slower than the Red Bull. So, yeah, absolutely brilliant from Oscar. But let's go on to Lando Norris, because like I said, Lando performed well. Let's give him, you know, some credit. Um, came through the field at a decent speed. The only issue with his race that I will say is I do still feel as though he could have been a bit quicker when he was behind Alex Albon. I don't know if that was because he had burnt his tyres out from following on the dirty air or he was just trying to look after them, baby them, let's say, to get himself to lap 30, what was it like, lap 36, 37, until he made his pit stop. Again, I don't know exactly why his pace dropped off the way it did because there was quite a few laps where he wasn't even catching Alexander Albon, um, you know, who was on the same compound starting the Grand Prix. So, if he had been a bit quicker during that phase, I mean, Lando maybe could have even put some pressure on Russell for, say, the podium position in the end. But fourth place is still an amazing result for him. Still outscores for Stappen by, uh, what was it, by three points, because obviously Lando took the fastest lap point. And the gap now down to 59 points. Um, in terms of qualifying, it was a bit, you know, a bit of a weird situation what happened in qualifying. You know, he made the mistake that he backed off because he thought there was a yellow. But I think the yellow had very quickly gone away and turned to a green um, or a white flag, something like that. So, yeah, I think he, I think you'd probably say misjudged that situation. So I think you could apportion a bit of blame. On to Lando for what happened in qualifying. But at least on race day, he got the best out of the car and delivered the result that was clearly possible. Going forward for the rest of the season, we've got seven races to go. Obviously, we're racing this weekend in Singapore and then there's a four-week break until the final six races. But seven races to go, 59 points behind... If I'm Lando Norris, my aim, what I'm saying to myself is just make sure we outscore Max by 10 points per race. And 10 points per race is basically if Lando wins, then Max has to be, you know, third or lower for Lando to keep gaining a good amount to the point where when we get to the end of the season, Lando Norris will be the world champion. For example, if Lando gains 10 points per race between now and the end of the season, Lando Norris will win the championship by, what would it be, like 11 points or something like that. So that's what, you know, either Lando needs to tell himself or McLaren needs to tell Lando is, you know, 10 points a race. 
That's what you've got to gain on max. If you gain 10 points per race, you will be the driver's world champion. And even going into that final race, you'll probably be leading the championship. So, it is absolutely on. Lando Norris can win this championship. It is all, though, down to him. Red Bull have got their own issues. I'll get onto them later. I don't know why they really were so slow in the race when in qualifying they were clearly competitive. Um, but the car is there. This McLaren car is a race winning car. It can win any race. That's what we've seen in the last few races. That it is capable of winning every race. It is all down, of course, to whether the team doesn't make any major mistakes... And whether the driver doesn't make any major mistakes. So for Lando Norris, just make sure you get the best out of the car on race day. Every race day until the end of the season. And if you do that, then I think there is a decent chance that he ends up world champion. Because again, Max Verstappen and Red Bull have still got their issues. And, you know, Max and Red Bull can't even get onto the podium at the moment to save their lives. And if that continues and Lando can, you know, get on a bit of a race win streak, then it's inevitable probably that Lando Norris will win the championship. But again, it all comes down to Lando Norris. He has no, as I said a couple of weeks ago at Monza, no one else to blame, no one else to point fingers at. It's all down to him now. We know he's super quick. He should out-qualify Oscar most times between now and the end of the season. So, you know, and Oscar, I think, will try to help Lando in situations where it's obvious that he should help in terms of the Drivers' Championship. So, that you know, in terms of the Drivers' title, that's what it comes down to. Lando Norris... Getting the best out of himself. And if he does that for the final seven races, he will be the world champion of 2024. But do I trust him to do that? I'll be honest, no, I don't. But he has time to prove me wrong. And given how quick that McLaren car is, he has plenty of chances to prove me wrong for the rest of this year. So we will see. But there is no doubt about it, guys. The Drivers' Championship battle is still on. 100%. And there is still, I would say, a very good chance, given how quick McLaren are. I think there's a very good chance that the championship on the driver's side will be up for contention in the final race of the year. Between Verstappen and Norris. I'd be very surprised if Leclerc you know, is in that championship fight. I know he gained a few points on Max yesterday. Uh, I think eight points he gained. But Leclerc, I think, is 78 points behind. Leclerc's going to have to do something quite special in these final seven races to be able to even have a chance, to be honest. So it should be Max versus Lando. So we will see whether Lando can deliver the job and get the reward in the end. But, uh, yeah, fantastic for McLaren. First ever podium, never mind, race win in Baku. And the best bit about Oscar Piastri's drive is that he won in the second fastest car. When you get race wins, you know, getting race wins is great. Most drivers get wins in the in a car that is the fastest car that weekend. That's just how things tend to go most of the time. The race wins that separate you from the good to, or you know, the, the race wins that take you from being a, a very good driver to an elite driver are the ones where you win in a car that shouldn't be winning for that weekend. And that's exactly what Piastri did in Baku. He won the race in a car that shouldn't have won that race. He won that race, not McLaren. So absolutely superb job by the Aussie. We'll see what he does in Singapore. Let's go on to the, uh, the uh, Ferrari team. Because I do feel a bit sorry for them. Because they had probably... In terms of their own performance and quality, they probably had the best race weekend since Monaco. 
that was the probably the last time I remember Ferrari being this quick and this dominantly quick at times. Leclerc took pole by three tenths of a second. Obviously, Leclerc was super quick all weekend. I was stupid going into qualifying to doubt him and Ferrari. Uh, I will not do that again, given that he took his uh, fourth consecutive pole. Um, and then, yeah, the race, he was pulling away from Piastri at two, three tenths of a second a lap easily. Wasn't having to destroy his tyres. And then after the pit stop, Ferrari, I'm sure, would love to go back to those couple laps before Piastri made that move on Leclerc just to understand why Piastri got up to the back of Leclerc. Was Leclerc, again, lackadaisical in warming his tyres up? Or did the Ferrari just have issues warming the tyres up? Was the McLaren a lot better at that? Whatever the case may be, Piastri got up to the back of Leclerc and then made a stunning move which I'm sure Ferrari and Leclerc were shocked by. And then Leclerc applied a shit ton of pressure to Piastri. Leclerc was behind Piastri for what? Um, I think 20... I think it must have been just over 25 laps. Probably 26, 27 laps. He was right behind him. And had what? Three or four goes at passing Piastri, but none of them were close to being successful because again Piastri just defended his position so well another issue obviously was Ferrari were a bit slower in the speed trap this weekend or this weekend just gone because they added a bit more wing to their car because I don't think they expected to be in a position where they needed to overtake but that's the way it was and yeah that did hurt Ferrari because if they had had maybe an extra three four kilometers an hour then maybe Leclerc could have passed Piastri and at least forced Piastri into defending a bit harder and be a bit more on the edge rather than what he was at times. Um, but, you know, Leclerc tried everything he could. Piastri was just better than him. And sometimes as a driver, you just have to hold your hands up. I mean, it's the same thing in sports, isn't it? Whether it's boxing... Um, you know, any one-on-one -on -one contest, you know, tennis, stuff like that. You can play as well as you want. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll compare it to tennis because I do watch tennis quite a bit. You could play the perfect match, hit your forehand, your backhand perfectly, serve, you know, numbers really high, accurate, but still lose. I mean, it's happened quite a lot in tennis. Uh, the the one match I remember as a kid was the, I think, 2009 Wimbledon men's final where Andy Roddick probably played as well as he could have in that final against Roger Federer, but Federer won after, what was it, like five and a half, six hours? Roddick couldn't have played any better. That was probably the best performance he ever had on you know, or at Wimbledon, but it wasn't enough. And, you know, after that, he, you know, a couple of years after that, I think he retired because he just couldn't get to that peak again. Um, you know, that's basically what we saw here. Obviously, Leclerc is not going to fall off a cliff and retire in a couple of years. But you see my point, you know, sometimes in sport, you can put in yourself a perfect performance, be absolutely brilliant, do everything well, be super quick, but still not win. Even if you're in the fastest car, because the other guy is, or was on that day, just better. It does happen. So, for Leclerc, there's nothing you can say. He did the best he could. Yeah, his tyres went at the end, but those tyres were punished for good reason. Because he was trying to get back into the lead of the race. And if he did get back into the lead... Leclerc would have won that race. He would have eventually pulled away and won that race. But it was just a matter of could he get into the lead. But he couldn't do it because Oscar defended too well. You know, placed his car so well and kept getting a great exit from turn 1, turn 2, uh, turn 16 and 15 as well. So, you know, hats off to Piastri in the end. But... Well, I, I was going to say something about Ferrari there, but I'll just uh, save that for a second. Just want to talk about Carlos Sainz quick. 
obviously had his accident with Sergio Perez. I still am leaning into saying racing incident because I don't want to sit here and like accuse sites of like trying to seriously do anything bad to Perez. But I will say that that accident is probably more so on sites than Perez because he was the car ahead. But I think I think it was just a racing incident. It was uh, thankfully not serious in terms of any injuries because they did go into the wall very very hard but it's a shame because Sainz got up to third with a couple of laps to go and if not for that accident I think Carlos would have finished in third place in what was a very good race performance probably Carlos's best race performance in quite a few months to be honest, we've not really seen... I mean, the Dutch Grand Prix, he had a good one where he went from, like, what was it, like, 11th or 10th up to 5th, I think it was. But a lot of the time in the last two or three months, he's not really been anywhere as Carlos. But that was a very good last 20 laps, pace-wise, that he put in in the Ferrari car. But it did also prove that Ferrari had the best car because Leclerc was constantly pressurizing Piastri and Sainz was catching, you know, the McLaren, his teammate and Perez quite quickly in those final 20 laps. Uh, so yeah, shame for Sainz, but that's the way it is. It also shame for Ferrari and the Constructors' Championship because even if they, you know, you know, not winning the race, if they had finished second and third, you know, 33 points, that would have been a very good gain of points not on McLaren who obviously took the lead of the Constructors Championship congratulations to them um, but they would have outscored Red Bull by um, quite a bit more than they did uh, they would have outscored Red Bull by what it would have been like 23 points they would have outscored Red Bull instead of eight points so yeah bit of a shame there for Ferrari but I hope Ferrari are not discouraged by what happened in Baku because it was quite a positive weekend given you know what we've seen of them in the last three months they had the fastest car all weekend let's be honest in normal circumstances they would have won that race but you know Piastri just had a 10 out of 10 performance pretty much which prevented them from winning you know, that's just the way it is. So I, I just really hope Ferrari don't get down on themselves after that because they were as good as you could be in trying to win a race, but somehow didn't win the race. But like I said, that is just the way it is. What I'm very excited to see, though, uh, this weekend in Singapore is obviously they've had an up-torn, uh, up torn up turn. <laughs> in form recently this weekend's race will tell us whether that is because of new upgrades because obviously they brought a big upgrade package at monza they've been very quick since monza but this weekend's race in singapore a high aero circuit will tell us for sure if it's because of the upgrade and if it is because of the upgrade then ferrari will be race winning contenders until the end of the year which is what we want, especially with Leclerc in the form he's in. So, cannot wait to see if Ferrari are, you know, if they can be contending for pole position with McLaren, that would be perfect. That would be perfect. Um, you know, if they were to be able to be as quick as they were last year in Singapore, even better. But I'd be very surprised if they were, you know, as quick as they were a year ago uh, around those streets. But, We'll see. We'll see you know, what Ferrari do. They are very much in form at the moment, Scuderia. Um, let's now go on to Red Bull Racing quickly. There's not really much to say about Red Bull in terms of the race. Qualifying, they fucked up massively. They were looking quick in Q1 and 2 and then just had two just honking laps in uh, Q3 when I think they probably could have ended up on the front row and at least both cars in the top five, but they ended up fourth and sixth. Made a good start to the race of both cars. Sergio Perez, his pace was pretty good, actually, in the race. 
Um, obviously, you know, in the middle of the race and you know, in the last 20 laps or so, him being as close to the leader as he was, that was helped by Oscar and Leclerc battling like they were and obviously hurting each other's tyres. But his performance and pace was good. And it was absolutely contending for the race win. So, you know, obviously what happened at the end with Sainz is a shame. But nobody should be complaining about Sergio Perez's performance. This, you know, this Grand Prix weekend just gone. Perez did the best he could. It was just a shame it ended the way it did. Max Verstappen, though, finishing in fifth. What a disaster for him. He had absolutely no pace in that Red Bull and clearly had some sort of setup issue with that car because even though Perez has looked really quick this weekend, uh, you know, just gone compared to Max, Max was still quick, was still right there with Perez. But for some reason, in the race, again, Perez was up in the top three, like a second and a half off the lead. And Max was like half a minute behind battling cars that hadn't even pitted yet. So I, I'd i love to know what, you know, or how different the setups were for Perez and Verstappen. Because it has to be setup related. I know Perez is very good in Baku, but... Max was nowhere near the same level as Perez in in Baku, which is obviously unlike him. I mean, we've seen Max be behind Perez in Baku, but we've not seen him be like half a minute away battling, you know, in a completely different race, basically. That's never happened. So, yeah, the only thing I can think of is it was setup related. The thing is, though, is the setup of the car through Friday and through qualifying up until Q3 seemed fine. But then in the race, after the good start, just no pace. Mercedes had the same with George Russell, just absolutely zero pace in that first stint. Verstappen was losing one second a lap to Leclerc per lap. When in qualifying, Red Bull were probably only a couple tenths of a second off the pace if they had actually done a good lap in Q3. You know, how can you explain that difference? I can't explain it. Um, and yeah, from Red Bull's perspective, the only thing you could hope is that they will uh, improve in, um, in Singapore. But yeah, quite a shocking performance from Red Bull in Baku and finally we'll touch on Mercedes-Benz we're not going to touch on them that much because again there's not really much to say about them and we've said that for the last couple race weekends because and I think Mercedes have even said it I think after Monza they feel as though they've lost a bit of performance compared to their rivals since the summer break and that is indeed how it feels they just haven't been contenders really it feels like in holland they just weren't quick at all um monza they were on the pace in qualifying would have been interesting to see in the race with russell if he didn't have that damage what he could have done but then in baku in qualifying they were poor uh russell i remember especially did a poor first sector in, in q3 and that's why mercedes which is so far away from the battle for pole and then in the race, again, like Verstappen, Russell was a second a lap off the pace. And then once he put fresh tyres on, seemed better, but was still miles off the pace of the front runners. Was able to pass Max Verstappen. Very good move there by George Russell. And overall, Russell did the best he could. Uh, got a podium, bit of a lucky result, but I think he deserves a bit of luck after what happened at Monza. Um, but yeah, Mercedes are just not, they're not race winning contenders at the moment. I think they're still, to a degree, podium contenders, but they're not race-winning contenders right now, and they need a new upgrade if they've got one in the po uh, pipeline to give them, say, an extra two to three tenths of a second, because that's what they need, I think, to get back to where they were a couple months ago. Uh, for Lewis Hamilton, a very bad weekend, but also weird weekend. 
qualifying wasn't really surprising that he was slower than his teammate he's never been really that quick compared to teammates in Baku it's always been one of his weakest tracks Baku um but yeah he was four tenths of a second off Russell in qualifying qualified in seventh took a new power unit for reasons that I believe is because they saw an issue on the on the power unit at least I hope that's what it was started him on the wrong compound of tyre which really hurt his race because he had zero, and I mean zero pace. N not even zero pace, sub-zero pace <laughs> is what he had in the first stint. And it wasn't entirely his fault. Mercedes did not help him with the, the tyre choice there. Um, and then he went to the hard tyre. Was probably half a second better off doing that, but still had issues with the tyres. Uh, tyres getting too hot. Him having to drive a certain way to get them down. Improved, you know, his his pace and his position. But it wasn't really until that Sainz Perez accident that he actually started to look like he was in a promising position. Because I think before then he was in like 12th place battling uh, Williams and a Haas. That is obviously not what Lewis Hamilton should be doing. Um, but I, I need to say this, that with his performance in Baku... It was not entirely the team's fault. Yeah, if tyre temperature issues, you can blame that on the team if they if they didn't get things right. Absolutely you can. But I don't think you can blame all of what happened in back on, on just Mercedes-Benz. I do think as well what compounded that weekend for Hamilton was also his pace not being good. And that's what we've seen this season is Lewis Hamilton in qualifying just has not had consistently good pace. I know there's a lot of people out there, uh, Hamilton fans, certain Hamilton fans, not all Hamilton fans, but certain Hamilton fans that want to claim conspiracy and say that this is all some big, you know, uh, act to get Lewis Hamilton and to make him look as bad as possible because he's leaving Mercedes and stuff like that. There's no evidence for that. Um, Lewis Hamilton just hasn't performed well enough this season. And if you, you know, to be honest, since the ground effect era began in 2022, Lewis Hamilton's level has dropped. He still performed well in 2022 and 2023. He was still a you know high performing driver, still one of the top, you know, two three drivers on the grid. But it's not the same Lewis Hamilton. And this year is a further development of that. So we cannot just sit here and say it's all the team's fault when, you know, for this season, it isn't all the team's fault. Yeah, in Baku, if they did fuck up on tyre temperatures and, you know, you know that they should be blamed for that. Tyre choice to start the race, definitely they should be blamed for that because it was a stupid decision given how well the hard compound tyre was going to perform in that race, which everyone knew... After Friday, Lewis Hamilton literally did a hard tyre stint on Friday when Mercedes were clearly the quickest team. So they clearly knew that compound was good, but they decided not to use it. Um, so blame them for that. But again, we cannot blame everything on Mercedes. Lewis Hamilton has to take a big deal of responsibility for this season's lack of performances when you know he has been lacking. There's been some races, obviously, where he's done very well. Obviously, he has won a couple Grand Prix this, uh, this season, which has been great to see, you know, him back winning races. But that level he's been at on those weekends, he hasn't been doing that every weekend. It That's only been once every, you know, how in, in, in maybe three races or three or four races. It, and that's not good enough. And Lewis Hamilton, trust me, he knows that. He knows that to be an elite driver, you can't just perform really well once every so-and-so weekends. And we'll see, obviously, at Ferrari next year whether he does get better. But based on how he's performing at the moment, he uh, is not looking great, is he, Lewis Hamilton? Um, but yeah, those are the top teams. For the other teams, Williams, massive shout-out to them. Brilliant pace all weekend. Brilliant performance by Albon and especially Franco Colapinto. And after that performance, lots of rumours now, uh, now that Colapinto could seriously even maybe be on the grid 
next year, maybe in that Sauber, which of course is going to become Audi in 2026, Colapinto doing exactly what he needs to do to put himself in the window for a seat. And yeah, I really, really am happy for him. He's definitely talented, as people have seen. Now it's up to the other teams to decide what to do with him. Um, Oliver Behrman, also shout out to him. Beating his teammate Holkenberg, very experienced and good midfield driver, obviously Holkenberg. And yeah, Behrman, good effort. Maybe at times could have been a bit quicker during the race, uh, but overall good effort. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it from the Azerbaijan Grand Prix weekend. And championship-wise, things are different. McLaren, obviously, now leading the Constructors' Championship. Ferrari closed the gap to Red Bull, so they're still you know, in there. Um, and now on the driver's side, Lando Norris slightly closer to Verstappen, but with seven races to go, Lando, like I said earlier, he still does have a very good chance at winning this championship. It all comes down to whether he can perform in what is a very, very good car and what should be this weekend in Singapore, the fastest car on the grid. Uh, but thank you guys for coming along to this review of the Azerbaijan Grand Prix. It's been great to have you along. Just an update as to what the plan is uh, content-wise for Singapore. I'll be doing a qualifying watch-along live on Saturday at 12.30pm UK time. Obviously, qualifying begins at 2pm UK time, so we'll do the usual build-up for an hour and a half, then cover the session, then do a reaction afterwards. I won't be doing a race watch along because the races in Singapore normally are quite boring. And I don't think the track layout that they altered for last year, I don't think that's remaining in place for this year. So, yeah, sadly, it's going to be more of a boring track for us. Uh, but there will be, the day after the Singapore Grand Prix, a review of that particular race and then uh next week i will uh try to on stream and probably in the podcast remind and announce uh my plans of content for the four week break between the singapore and us grand prix so that's what's coming up on the channel thank you guys again for coming along for this podcast episode and until next time it has been me chazar hd goodbye <laughs>